in section 5.2, we discuss general information about partial differential equations. In simple words, a partial differential equation is an equation that involves partial derivatives. In our course, we will discuss only one type of such equations, a so-called heat equation. It's exactly what we discuss in section 5.3. Please take a look at the following boundary value problem. Is our partial differential equation and over here we have a bunch of conditions. What is u? u is temperature. u is a function of two variables. t is time. x is position. We are trying to describe temperature at any point on the interval from 0 to L. Keeping this in mind, please take a look at condition number one. What do you think? Y of x0 is equal to f of x. What does this mean? Is it saying that when the second variable put into u is zero, it's just a function of x? Yes, but talking about applications, keeping in mind our problem, u is temperature. What does it mean, u of x zero? Temperature is just a function of position. Right, but what does it mean, u of x zero? Initial condition. Initial condition means what? Initial temperature distribution at time zero. Absolutely, initial temperature. We say initial because t is equal to zero. In simple words, at the very beginning, any point has temperature f of x, where x is position. How do you understand condition number two? Temperature at the boundary zero. Temperature at the end points is equal to zero, no matter what is t. At any point of time, at the end points, temperature is zero. Any questions here? Professor, what is alpha? Alpha is some number. Alpha is a parameter. Okay, in this section, we want to find the solution of the whole boundary value problem. Here's how we do it. Step one, skip the middle condition and consider just the equation, which is over here, and this, which is over here. The goal is to find infinitely many solutions of this new boundary value problem. So once again, the difference between this and this is the following. Over here, we do not have the middle condition. We want to find infinitely many solutions of this boundary value problem. Then later, we will combine these solutions in order to create a new solution which satisfies not only this, but also this. This will be step two. Once again, step one, find infinitely many solutions of this boundary value problem. Here is how we do it. Please take a look at this. So once again, u is a function of two variables x and t. Not any function on two variables can be written as the product 
of two functions on just one variable. For example, sine of x plus t cannot be written as x of x times t of t. However, it turns out that if we restrict ourselves to only this type of function, it will be easy for us to find infinitely many solutions of this boundary value problem. Here is why. Observe that if you can be written as this problem, then the left-hand side, which is partial derivative of u by t, is really easy to find. Let me remind you that when we take partial derivative by t, we think about x as about a constant. Since x is a constant, the whole x of x is a constant. And when we take the derivative, we factor the constant out. Conclusion. Partial derivative of u by t, which is equal to partial derivative of this by t, is equal to x of x, or which is over here, times calculus 1 derivative of t because t is a function on one variable. Similar, partial derivative of u by x of order 2 is equal to calculus 1 derivative of x of order 2. Because now t is a constant, therefore t of t is a constant, and we can factor out this constant. Conclusion, if u is equal to this, a left-hand side of our equation is this, right-hand side of our equation is this, and if you replace this by this and this by this, we'll get exactly what is written here. Here is what we do next. Let us divide both sides of this equation first by x and then by alpha square t. In short, let us divide both sides of this equation by x times alpha square t. After all cancellations, we will get this. In other words, what is written here gives us this. Guys, any questions how we jump from here to here? Professor, Yeah. can you explain again why we're able to just represent this function as a multiple of two different functions? Very good question. Know that at the very beginning, we do not have basically any information about you except for you satisfies this. So we are free to do whatever we want in order to solve this boundary value problem. For example, it turns out, and we will see it in a moment, that if we consider only functions that can be written in this way, we will have enough material to construct infinitely many solutions of this boundary value problem. Does this answer your question? Okay, yeah, yeah. Well, now it's time to take a close look at what is written here. No, that x is a function on one variable, x. Therefore, x prime prime over x is again a function on x. For the same reason, on the right-hand side, we have again a function on just one variable, t. So, on the left-hand side, we have a function on x, 
on the other side we have a function on t in other words let us denote the left hand side by say capital f and the right hand side by capital g in this case this equation becomes capital f of x is equal to capital g of t may I ask a question if two functions on two different variables are equal no matter what we plug in instead of x or instead of t what can you say about graphs of these functions anybody they're constant they are constant functions here is why please take a look at this imagine that graphs of these functions are same completely same they coincide but graph of the left hand side function is some curve graph of the right hand side function is same curve since variables are different for left hand side function you can plug in one point for the right hand side function you plug in another point values will be different but looking at this no matter what we plug in to the left hand side and no matter what we plug in to the right hand side they should be equal the only way to achieve this is the following graphs of both functions should be straight lines more over horizontal lines more over both functions should be equal to the same constant only in this case a left hand side is equal to the right hand side no matter what is x or t conclusion the left hand side is a constant function and the right hand side is a constant function more over in both case we have the same constant the only question you can ask is why we have negative guys we can denote this constant by positive lambda or by c we can put instead of lambda say c but for some reason for convenience let us put here negative lambda you will see what is the reason for negative lambda a little bit later next so we start with this differential equation partial differential equation we assume that u can be written as this we come up with the following conclusion x satisfies this t satisfies this both are differential equations this is why i said that it is convenient to restrict ourselves only with functions that can be rewritten in this way we started with a partial differential equation we came up with two normal differential equations and we perfectly know how to solve these differential equations but before we do so let us discuss what happens to this condition so u of zero t is equal to zero no that since u is x times t u of zero t is x of zero because x is zero times t of t but observe that we care about infinitely many non-trivial solutions of our boundary value problem 
since we care about non-zero solutions of this boundary value problem, t of t cannot be zero. Because if t of t is the zero function, u is the zero function. But remember, the goal is to come up with infinitely many non-trivial solutions. So we can assume that t of t is non-zero. Therefore, we can divide both sides by t of t, and we get the following. x of zero is equal to zero. It's exactly what is written here. For the same reason, we use condition number two, which becomes x of lt of t. We divide both sides by t of t, and we get condition number two. Lastly, and this is the reason why I said it is convenient to put here minus in front of lambda. If we move x from the denominator to the right, and then move negative lambda x back to the left, we will get exactly of what is written here. Now, please compare this and this. Is it not the same? It's absolutely the same thing. We just replace x by y. This is the reason why we discuss this problem in our course. We just answered the following question. For which a lambda, this boundary value problem has a non-trivial solution. Here is a complete description of such lambdas. It's exactly of what we have here. A lambda is equal to this. We just copy this formula. And then x of x is equal to this. We copy this formula. Done. We came up with a complete description of all x's that satisfy this. Lastly, in order to find a formula for t, move a lambda square t to the right, and then move negative lambda alpha square t to the left. We will get this. What do we see in front of us here? It's first order homogeneous, a linear differential equation with constant coefficient. We perfectly know how to solve it. Either we use the separation of variables method, in order to come up with this solution. Or we use this formula from section 1.2. Both approaches will give us same result. T is equal to E to negative lambda alpha square T. But remember what is lambda. Lambda is this. So if in this formula we replace a lambda by this, we will get this. Here is a formula for t. Now let us put pieces together. u is x of x times t of t. For x, we come up with this formula. We have infinitely many functions here because n is any positive integer. And now, since u is x times t, u n is sine of n pi x over l times e. Here, we have infinitely many functions that satisfy this boundary value problem. Folks, any questions here? Uh, could you re repeat from when you said um, lambda equals n squared pi squared over L? Well, uh, what is written here is same as this. And we just discussed that the values of lambda 
for which this boundary value problem has a non-trivial solutions are n square pi square over l square. It's exactly what is written here. So the xn of x equals sine uh, n pi x over l, that's a general solution? These are formulas for x. These are formulas for t. I say plural because here we have n. And n is any positive integer. And now let us put pieces together. U is x times t. We multiply this by this. We get this. Does this answer your question? Yeah, it makes sense. Thanks. Now, let us go back to our initial problem. Know that u should satisfy this, this, but also this condition. We cannot really expect that for any given function f, our u will be equal to f. For example, imagine that f of x is 1. Obviously, what is written here is not equal to 1. So what do we do? Here's an important observation. It turns out that not only these U's satisfy our solutions of our boundary value problem, but also any their linear combination is also a solution. I show it in appendix two, which means we can plug in instead of CN any numbers, the resulting expression will be a solution of this boundary value problem again. For example, please take a look at this. Suppose f of x, or which is over here, is equal to 2 sine 3 pi x plus 5 sine 8 pi x. In this case, we will be able to find u that satisfies not only this and this, but also this is the formula. u is 2 sine 3 pi x times e to this power plus 5 sine 8 pi x times e to this power. Here is y. Observe that each of these functions, according to what is written here, is a solution of the following boundary value problem. This in combination with this, according to our discussion. And also observe that if t is equal to zero, these components disappear. Therefore, our function u, if t is equal to zero, becomes this. So, this function indeed satisfies not only this boundary value problem, but the whole thing. You may ask me a question why we have here 9 and here 64, because in this formula, we raise e to the following power, negative alpha square n square, and so on. And in our case, n is equal to 3 here. So we have 3 square 9 and 8 here. So we have 8 square 64. Very last thing. You may ask me a question why there is no L. The reason is the following. L in our particular problem is equal to 1. This completely solves the problem. Folks, any questions about this example? Professor, uh, I'm sorry to make you repeat yourself, but can you go over the series again, the infinite series? Yes. Or, I mean, not infinite, just the series. Uh, yes, this sum 
it's not infinite series yet. Here we have a finite sum. In appendix two, please take a look at appendix two. I show the following. Suppose use satisfy our boundary value problem, which means we have this, this, and so on, this. So each such U satisfies boundary value problem two. U satisfies boundary value problem two means line number one, line number two, and so on, line number n. Now, let us multiply both sides here by C1, both sides here by C2, and so on, both sides here by Cn. We get this. And do same for these conditions. Done. Lastly, let us add up these equations together. We will get this and this. And observe that u is c1 u1 plus c2 u2 plus and so on cn un. Therefore, what is written here is du dt, or what is written here is d2 u dx square, and what is written here, this becomes u of 0 t, this becomes u of lt, therefore our u, which is a linear combination of u1, u2, and so on, un, is again a solution of our boundary value problem. Does this make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I just, I guess I just don't understand why we, we made u a series or a sum. Because these u's, the u's that we just found, satisfy this. But we cannot really expect that these u's will satisfy also the middle condition. Look, imagine that f of x is equal to 1. Obviously, this is not equal to 1. Correct? Yes. But the goal is to find the solution of the whole thing. So what do we do? Step one, observe that not only this, but the whole thing, any linear combination of this function satisfies boundary value problem two. And now we have more degrees of freedom because no matter what we plug in instead of this, this the whole thing is a solution of this. Therefore, in some cases, it is possible to find C1, C2, and so on, Cn, such that this is equal to this. It's exactly what happened in this example. C3 is 2 because here n is equal to 3. C8 is 5. All other c's are equal to 0. This function satisfies the differential equation and these two conditions, and obviously this function satisfies the middle condition because this component and this component disappear. What do you think? Yeah, uh, that answers my question. Any other questions? Did we do 5.2? Don't worry about 5.2. 5.2 is just introduction general information about partial differential equations. And as I said, all we need is the following. A partial differential equation is an equation that involves partial derivatives. Here we give 
some examples. And by the way, most important example for us is this. This is what we are talking about. And here is the solution. We just discussed this component and this component. What we need is the rest. Will be discussed on Wednesday and Friday. Uh, I don't know if this is a simple or complex question, but uh, how come here we have an infinite series, whereas before we were doing finite? So, here in Appendix 2, we show that if these U's are solutions of our boundary value problem 2, any their finite linear combination is a solution again. But then we make another step. Turns out that instead of finite linear combinations, we can also consider infinite linear combinations. It gives us even more degrees of freedom. Say, if f is equal to 1, it is impossible to find C1 and so on, Cn, such that this is equal to 1. However, if we replace capital N by infinity, in this case, yes, it is possible to find Cs, such that the whole construction converges to 1. But in order to find these Cs, we need Fourier series. Does this make sense? Yes. By the way, remember in the middle condition, T is equal to zero. Therefore, the goal is to find formulas for C's such that F of X is equal to the following infinite series. This will be discussed in the next section.